Thanks, Gary. Good, e good evening, everybody. It's Gary Dunnett from National Parks Association. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, webinar in our Connecting with Nature series. Just like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on various Aboriginal lands and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, for those of you who participated in MPA seminars before, they're normally a bit of a sort of solo performance or at most a, a duet with two presenters, but tonight's is very much a medley. Um, we've got four wonderful speakers who are going to talk to us of different um, topics. And I think that sort of medley is really appropriate given tonight's sort of overall theme, which is looking at citizen science. So in other words, opportunities for us as individuals to contribute to a whole range of scientific inquiry, but also that really important business of understanding what's happening in our local and regional and state environments you know, adding to that information base. So um, looking forward to the medley that's going to be sort of sung by these four presenters. We'll be starting with Steph Clark from MPA, who's going to talk to us about um, MPA's existing citizen science program. We'll then go to Erin Rogers, who's going to give us some insight into the Atlas of Living Australia, which is one of those fantastic repositories of information, which is now, uh, in a situation where we as individuals can provide information to us. Um, Steve Banyan Smith, who's you know, one of those media tarts of the last sort of year, who um, has been gaining a wonderful profile off the back of some really fascinating work looking at distribution of koalas in a part of Sydney where they were previously regarded as a sort of an itinerant species. And, and Steve's been, and uh, his, um, companion Tom have shown that the picture is really, really different to what anyone understood. And that's got some very um, substantial implications for land management. And Nick Hopkins, who's going to talk to us about the Beach Watch program, which is, you know, not just about environmental quality, but it actually goes down to human health as well. So um, really looking forward to those. I'm going to pass over to Steph in just a second, but just to remind everybody that because it's a webinar, you can't ask questions um, orally immediately, but what you can do is if you just hold your cursor over the bottom bar of Zoom, you'll see Q&A. And if you write your questions into that Q&A tab, um, I'll make sure that I ask them of the presenters towards the end of the presentation. If you've just got comments that you'd like to share with the other participants, by all means, put those into the chat. But um, easiest for me to track sort of questions you're looking for a specific answer to if you put them under Q&A. Okay, well, thanks all. And uh, Steph, we're gonna pass to you as our first presenter of the night. Beautiful, thanks so much, Gary. I'll just open up my presentation for everyone. Great, so hi, hi everyone. Um, nice to be with you all. I'll just make sure that I can still share screen. There we go. Can we all see it? Thumbs up for the yep, presenters? That's cool. It. Great. Thank you. Great. So I'm Steph Clark. I was MPA's citizen science officer for um, about three years. There were um, two or three more of us. Um, and it was a incredibly, it was an incredible job. Um, it meant that I got to engage with loads of community members, which is why when Sam asked me if I could be um, a part of this webinar, I said, yes, definitely. Um, really exciting projects that we ran and I would love to uh, talk to you all about it. So first up, um, I wish I could see you all, but I'll ask the question, um, who knows what citizen science is and have you heard of it before? And I want you all to imagine like, yeah, think of an answer to that question. Um, I'll pretend that I can see you all, maybe a couple of hands up there um, in my imaginary cr uh, crowd. Um, Basically, um, hopefully I'll answer that question for you. So um, what is citizen science? Let's go into it. So what's citizen science? Um, so citizen science projects engage members of the public uh, to take part in scientific research. 
uh, studies, basically. So these research studies generally aim to address important scientific questions and provide vital information to decision makers. Um, so in environmental and conservation-based citizen science, members of the public are generally um, involved by collecting data about wildlife or natural areas. And so what that can be can be like hugely, hugely within that kind of just uh, conservation and environment. The types of data collection can be so different, which is really, really exciting. So why has NPA been involved in citizen science and why did we have, uh, why have we had citizen science projects? So I'll get you all to have a read of the NPA logo. So uh, that's just down there. So NPA, National Parks Association of New South Wales, protecting nature through community action. So basically NPA really sees the value in citizen science to engage the general public in, um, in, in the environment. And because of that, um, you know, once you're directly engaged in the environment and seeing it for yourself, it's the best way to become like uh, active in, in protecting the environment if you weren't already. So citizen science enables a range of people from those with little, to, uh, little prior knowledge of Australian wildlife to experienced amateur naturalists to make a difference to the environment around them. Um, it also provides an ideal chance for the public to get involved directly in conservation around the environment. And connecting people with nature is one of the most effective means of changing people's perceptions and enthusiasm for the environment. So we had a whole lot of different citizen science projects. Um, a lot of it, a lot of our projects themselves were based around, um, you know, community engagement and we used it as an education tool, but um, all of the issues that the different projects addressed were, um, you know, around, um, uh, conservation issues, land clearing, the effects of land clearing, um, uh, basically seeing how urbanization affected different animals. So although our projects were largely based in education, a lot of the, or the data that was collected led to this kind of um, wider conservation, um, like ethic and like, you know, um, the, the data that was collected was used for a whole lot of different uh, research projects, which I'll go into. So I've talked a lot about data um, and data collection. Um, science projects, uh, sorry, citizen science projects are commonly led or supported by an expert in the appropriate scientific field. And this really ensures that the data that it's collected is reliable and is the right data for the right story. So um, MPA developed a citizen science manual. Um, and basically we did this to assist community groups to gather the appropriate data to make informed decisions on how to conserve our natural environment. So we did this separate to the citizen science projects that we ran. Um, and this is an incredible resource if any of you out there are thinking about um, running your own citizen science projects. Basically, it's got a whole lot of different survey methods um, that's used for, um, you know, survey techniques that's used for different um, surveys that you could uh, run. And it shows the best case um, sampling methods, um, sorry, best practice sampling methods. So um, it's a step-by-step -step guide on data collection. And it was developed by ecologists for a range of ecological surveys. And basically using um, like best practice survey methods, make sure that the data that is collected is reliable. Um, so here's an example. Um, it's just one of the pages um, that's in this, the manual itself. As you can see, if I can get it into the non-blur zone, it's a pretty chunky um, manual and it's split off into different styles of um, surveys. So for example, bird surveys, um, we've got, what else? Reptile and frog survey methods. It's an incredible resource. I'd recommend you all to have a look at it. Um, but here's an example of say a fauna survey. Um, so looking at the size of the study area. So zero to one hectares, one study site for each vegetation community. So it just shows you like minimum sampling effort and it's um, it's broken down into really simple and easy to understand language so that the general community can understand it and be involved. Um, yeah. And 
why did we do this? Why did we make this manual? Um, we did it to help provide information to community groups or individuals to gather data to make informed decisions on how to conserve our natural environment. And I really wanted to focus on, um, you know, this aspect um, of our involvement in citizen science, just because uh, I feel like it really lends its hand to the other, um, uh, like the topics that the other presenters are going into, because it's really that community engagement side of citizen science. Um, so what projects did has MPA run in the past? Um, we've done so many. Um, we did, uh, we've done Bring Back the Buzz, uh, and so basically that one was looking at pollinators in Western Sydney. Uh, that was supported by uh, Sydney researchers from Sydney Uni as well, just to make sure that our surveying methods um, were good and, you know, um, with, that we're using best practice of the time. Also, our, um, we use the methods in our um, manual. And um, basically we wanted to see um, look at the native pollinators at different sites and um, basically also uh, along with that doing uh, native plantings and so um, we involved schools and also local community groups um, who were some of them weren't involved so we ran like community days like um with like, you know, plant giveaways and stuff like that. And that was like often a lot of like new community members um, or also bush care groups. Uh, we've also run a project called Who's Living on My Land? Uh, that was a really cool one where we used infrared cameras and we gave them to private landholders. And basically it was to see what, um, uh, uh, what species, what mammal species mostly uh, were on their land and then they could make uh, different decisions around, you know, um, whether they should do like pest management control if they saw loads of foxes or if they saw rare, uh, rare species, they could make sure that they um, had vegetation like habitat uh, enough to, that was there to protect them and, you know, make sure that that population thrives. Uh, so that one was really cool. Um, and the final one uh, that I was really involved in, so I spent my most amount of time on it, was a really cool project called Dragons of Sydney. So this is the project that you see here. Um, and basically this one was, um, there was a huge amount of involvement from a PhD student called James. And he wanted to, like he knew the power of um, citizen science and community involvement in collecting like reputable data. And he also wanted to prove that citizen science was like, uh, could collect data that was, you know, reliable, you know, uh, basically uh, strong enough and good enough to be able to put into, you know, scientific journals. And, um, and so, he helped us produce that project and we reached out to uh, schools, community groups, um, like the general public, um, councils as well. Um, and basically we got uh, many, 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 many people involved. Um, it went on the radio and stuff like that too. And there was like this big mail out that happened to people in areas that we, you know, near our, um, our test sites. And basically we wanted to see how urbanization affected uh, water dragons. So we had really tight um, research methods and um, data, collect data collection methods. James would often come with us as well, which is really cool. And then the data that we collected helped him for his PhD research. And it was published in his PhD, which is incredible um, and a really cool um, experience that MPA got to have, yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steph. <clears throat> and you were on your allocated time to the minute. Well done. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> so our next speaker speaker is Dr. Erin Roger. Erin. Great. Thanks very much. How's that? You can see it okay? Yep, that's great. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for the invite to speak today. Uh, I just like to also acknowledge the lands on which I'm joining you from. I'm on Gadigal land today. 
And I'd like to honor and celebrate the spiritual and cultural and customary connections of indigenous people to country and also the biodiversity that forms part of that country. So I was asked today to talk a little bit about the Atlas of Living Australia or ALA and how we and citizen scientists can contribute to the ALA and then how ultimately that can make a difference. So I'll provide some examples of that as well. So just a quick overview of what the ALA is. I'm sure many of you online are familiar with it. We're a biodiversity data aggregation facility. We're about 12 years old now. Uh, so it's hard to imagine what life in Australia was like before the ALA, but really our purpose is to aggregate biodiversity data. So before the ALA, if you can picture a sort of disparate siloed data sets, whether that we're on researchers or government or industry or community computers, and it was very difficult to um, provide insights and analysis on the picture of biodiversity in Australia prior to the ALA coming into existence. So we have over 100, 000, 100 million occurrence records now, and we have over 900 data providers. And because of that, um, we're able to prevent, provide a very effective um, overview uh, for policy and scientific research. And we're a great resource for communities as well as education. So this is a graph um, that one of my colleagues in the science team in ALA developed. Uh, we were actually quite curious in terms of, I, I mentioned that we have 900 data providers. What percentage of data in the ALA comes from citizen science? And we were all actually quite surprised in terms of the growth in citizen science over the past 10 years that you can see from this figure. Um, and I think obviously we can attribute that to smartphones. And so many of us, if not all of us have a smartphone um, which has a number of different biodiversity recording apps, making it very easy to provide an observation with an automatic time and date stamp and uh, typically have that verified as well. Interesting that th there was a bit of a peak though again around 2020 onwards um, and there's no doubt that and it's hard to tease these two events apart but that the bushfires as well as COVID uh, saw huge growth in citizen science. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that as well. So in terms of how you can interact with the ALA, the first one, probably the most obvious one is to submit your data. And there's a number of different ways to do that. The first, and there are instructions on our, on our website, you can submit a whole data set. So there's an example of an Excel data set, um, and you can put that right into the ALA. The second way, which is probably the most familiar, is to submit data via a biodiversity recording app. So I have iNaturalist on the screen here, but there's lots of other examples, whether that's Nature Mapper or Butterflies Australia. Um, hopefully, if you're using an app, it provides data to the ALA, because that's so important for citizen science is to have open, publicly accessible data. And then the third way is to submit a record directly through the ALA. And again, there's instructions on our website about how to do that directly. But typically the observations are coming to us through these apps, as I mentioned. So some examples of how the data is being used. Um, we partnered with the Center for Ecosystem Sciences and at that time, uh, the Department of Ag, Water, Environment. It's ch since changed names with the Office of the Threatened Species Commissioner to run a series of bio blitzes in fire impacted areas. This is post 2019, 2020 bushfires. And so we had three, uh, three bio blitzes. And over the course of those three events, we had about 1700 species recorded just shy of 8,000 observations. Um, and that represented 29 threatened species as well. And so it was obviously a huge event for gathering data. Um, and it was part of a, a larger project called the Environment Re Recovery Project, which is run by the University of New South Wales. And the researchers there have already published a paper um, on the first round of data from the Environment Recovery Project. And the paper describes a put it down there, I've cited it down there, that um, first of all, citizen scientists, the, da the data that they were providing about um, the fires was accurate. And secondly, it was at scale. So they're able to provide data at the same scale as we saw um, the same extent of the bushfires. And so 
there's amazing things that you can do with these kinds of ad hoc observational records now, and some very powerful statistical techniques to make its analysis much more meaningful. So we're starting to look at ways about to um, understand survey bias, for example. Um, so some really interesting things can be done by these ad hoc observations. But sometimes we do need a little bit more than just a, a, a observation of a record. And this is where the, uh, something else, another project example called Flora Connections come in. And this is working with researchers from the Western Sydney University to, de to divide, develop methodology uh, to enable active flora groups to go out and record priority plant species. But the but this is a much more systematic way of recording data. So not just an ad hoc op observation, but providing much more information along with that record, whether that's habitat condition or threats, et cetera. And this kind of information is often required by threatened species committees to properly assess if a species so should be listed or not. And so all the information is on floraconnections.com, which is hosted by the ALA. And all survey data goes in through the ALA's BioCollect uh, platform, which is our um, systematic survey data um, application on the ALA. So the second way that users can interact with the ALA is to help digitize historical data. Um, many of you will be familiar with Digivolve, uh, which is run by the Australian Museum, but hosted by the Atlas of Living Australia. It's a fantastic way to get a glimpse into lots of different things. Um, there's camera chat data on there where you can identify species, or there's um, paper-based surveys to transcribe or old rather weather records, for example, it's, it's a really amazing resource. And this is one of the areas that saw a massive uptick, uptick in interest uh, and users post bushfires and also um, during COVID as you might well expect when many of us were, were stuck at home. An example of how that information on Digivel is used. Another project that we've worked on is with the National Collections um, at CSIRO. And the department uh, has a list of uh, 191 invertebrate species post fire that they're um, interested in and, and concerned about. And so we found out that about 7,000 specimens in these national research collections corresponded to those invertebrates on the list. And they were digitized in the CSRO labs, but then the, the digitized image and their paper based label were transcribed on the Digival platform. And some really fantastic results. So uh, there were species that weren't uh, didn't there weren't any records in the ALA prior to this um, project, or or ones with very few records, if any. And so hundreds of people participated in this project. And now with these digitized records, it will provide de the department, for example, with this historical information about insect abundance and distribution. Another way you can interact with the ALA is to join a uh, citizen science project. So we host the Australian Citizen Science Association's Project Finder. There's around 600 projects on there at the moment. It's a great way to prevent duplication of existing initiatives. And you can also start your own citizen science project as well. And importantly, it's connected to other resources such as the Chief Scientist of Australia's Education Star Portal or SciStarter, which is based in the US. And so you can participate in online projects that are, say, run out of the US and find them through this, the project finder. And just to sort of just to sum it out, sum this up, um, the power in ALA and citizen science comes from providing these structured surveys here. So whether that's through our BioCollect app or through um, something like Digival, combined with these simple opportunistic settings via apps such as iNaturalist or Questagame or Frog ID, they're aggregated into the ALA. And then we provide this data to something called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, where it can be used uh, globally. Uh, very, so it's very powerful and it's used, as I said, by government researchers, um, industry and of course communities. And so the final way that you can interact with the ALA is to engage with us, whether that's through signing up to newsletters, following our social channels, we can offer group training as well. Um, and we do have webinars as, as well, and a number of user guides and of course if there's anything that you'd like to query on the ALA, we really invite you to, uh, to do that as well and to reach out and to contact us. 
And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Erin. Um, now to Steve. Thanks, Gary. And thank you all for joining us. I was just looking through the participants and I see at least two thirds of them are female, which says something important, I think. We've listened to some very wise people. I'll try and provide a bit of contrast. Before I talk about tree wombats, I just have to say that I don't have a background in science. And if I and Gary and many other people that live in the southern part of Sydney could miss a population of koalas um, to the extent that we have done, it just proves that there is a lot of work out there for citizen scientists because the wise people didn't seem to have found them. All right, so in the time that I have, I'm just going to. Um, focus on one point. We've, um, Tom Christensen and I, as Gary suggested to, to some of us earlier, that we use a COVID lockdown to go for a bit of a walk. Um, we started in July last year and we've identified 107 individual koalas in the Southern Shire. And I'm just going to explain very briefly, and it'll take less than 10 minutes, how we did this. The wise people told us that um, grey gums, eucalyptus punctata, is their favourite food, and it sure seems to be, with just over 50% of all of our sightings. And there have been 213 sightings of the 107 tree wombats. So just over half the sightings have been in eucalyptus punctata. So once we found a stand of these trees, and interestingly, the land managers in these parts, the National Parks and Wildlife Service and Stowe, the Gendagara Land Council and Sutherland Shire Council principally, don't even know where their um, best koala habitats are because they haven't done fine enough um, veg mapping. So here's another project. Anyway, so once we found a stand of grey gums, we looked at those that have been recently climbed. Grey gums have rather lovely palette to look for the incidence of things that climb them, which are various possums, koalas, and uh, lace monitors, I guess, insofar as the bark is relatively soft and they leave plenty of sign. So once we find fresh scratches, we start looking around on the ground and the delightfully aromatic koala scats um, contrast to the delightfully unaromatic uh, brush-tail possum scats. And then we start walking in donuts and we find koalas. Um, wonderful, there's some scats. Excuse, excuse me, Steve, sorry to interrupt. Did you have some pictures you wanted to share? Yeah. To illustrate your yeah. words? Are okay, you not we can't see them yet, no. So if you could ah. please share your screen. Share screen, hold on. My apologies. How do I get out of this? I've got 10 minutes previous, previous. And show maybe. No, here we go. So if you just go into the Zoom window and then hover over the share screen icon. Ah, very good. Yep. My apologies. I'm a bit of a virgin at this sort of thing. All good. Here we go. Can you see it now? Yep, that's excellent. It's just coming up now. Yep, that's it. Okay. So basically, the, my banter discussed the few numbers here, and I've just got up to where we're talking about koala scats, which are, like I say, delightfully aromatic. And you, when you break them, they smell like eucalyptus because pretty much that's all they eat. And you can see a tree there, a grey gum that's been heavily climbed. Most grey gums lose most of their bark each year, so it's a pretty good sign that they're around. This is just a screenshot off Google Earth in Heathcote National Park, and all the blue dots are koalas. Um, the yellow lines are just where we've been walking. Um, now, Really, the one message I wanted to um, get across in the time that we have here is that 
you don't need to go and actually catch koalas to identify them. You can identify them by their nostrils. So anyone with a decent zoom camera can be a koala researcher. So you don't have to worry about radio collars, drones, sniffer dogs. Um, here's some examples here. Now, what surprises me is that people from Planning Environment, National Park said, oh, how did you get onto this idea of nostrils? And I thought, hold on, didn't you guys tell me? But apparently not. So um, every koala has a basic, it's a bit like a whale fluke, if you like, that the interface between the inner pink part of a koala's nostrils and the, and the dark, darker um, part of the, the nose is not a straight line. So it's a lot of fun trying to um, identify individuals. What we found is if there were two observers, it was much easier because the koalas would actually, if we spread ourselves out, the koalas would look from one observer to the other to see if we were still there. I mean, koalas are not very bright, but they're incredibly good at being koalas. And so they'd look backwards and forwards and gotcha. And once we had the photo of their nostrils, we could move on. What else did we find? We actually found that, yeah, even though we're locally quite good at finding koalas, there were day, donut days, we'd call them. We'd go out and we couldn't find them. The other day we went to the back of Ingadine, Southern Shire, we found seven koalas. We went back a couple of days later, couldn't find any of them. I don't know where they went. Um, we end up with more mysteries than we have answers. But what we did find in areas that had recently been burnt, for whatever reason, uh, there were very few koalas. And where there were people that take their dogs for a walk, also much less likely to find koalas. Koalas have got a very big nose. They've probably got a very big nose for a reason. They use it. Here are a couple of just the... Who are shots? These are koalas in Heathcote National Park. In both cases, the joeys of these uh, mothers are now independent, and they've been they've inherited the mums' territory, and the mums have been discovered on the periphery. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um... Thanks, Steve. Can you please stop sharing your screen, ah, Steve? Stop sharing screen. Yes, I can do that probably. How do I do? You are screen sharing. Stop share. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you. And we'll Bye. pass on to Nick. Mute. Great. Thanks, everybody. Can you see the title card breach watch? Yes, it's all there. Thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, so we're coming at citizen science from a slightly different angle. Um, yeah, my name's Nick Hopkins. I'm a member of Coast Watchers Association, and we're the premier environment group on the, the south coast uh, around Yerubadala Shire and southern Shoalhaven. And we're doing a lot of uh, monitoring of logging in the, the public native forests of our area because there's a lot of it going on. So, um, if you miss anything I'm going to talk about, it's actually a lot of it is on this particular uh, website called breachwatch.org.au, uh, and that's hosted on the by the Nature Conservation Council of New South Wales. And there's a great lot of tips and tricks there in these four different areas across this menu bar. So desktop surveying, what you can do. Uh, we're, we're particularly sort of encouraging people to adopt a forest, a native forest that might be up for logging in their sort of locality. Uh, and once you become aware that, uh, that something might be happening, uh, there's various different resources that you can um, tap into. The first one would be the Forestry Corporation's plan portal. And that's a critical one that will tell you what's actually coming up in your area, what, what's in their schedule to be logged. And you just get a free login and every time a compartment um, changes its status from, um, from uh, planning to approved to active, you'll get an email. So you'll know basically um, the timeline of things coming your way. 
I'll give you a few more resources, but we won't have time to really explore how to make use of them. But the EPA has got a great native forestry map viewer, and that will highlight a lot of different features in the compartment that you might be interested in. So you can go and see what's valuable there and what might trigger protections. The New South Wales Bionet Atlas is a great, another great resource. Uh, and it's a record of, um, of sightings of fauna and flora. Uh, and it's, we use that particular database because that's the one that Forestry Corporation has to consult when they're developing their harvest plans. It's part of the legislation. They have to go and see what are the records there on that particular database. Uh, and of course, Forestry Corporation has to put out ecology reports before they log any compartment and they can, uh, that, that's freely accessible as well. And the big one that we always refer to it's the uh, basically the rules that uh, are setting setting um, setting up what is actually allowed and what's disallowed in logging operations. It's called the CIFOA, two different documents, and they're big fat ones. One's the conditions, the one on the left here, and the one on the right is the protocols. We don't have hard copies of them. We just download them onto our desktop, and if there's uh, a particular thing that we're interested in, we'll type that item into the search bar of both those documents and see what comes up uh, in relation to um, those particular features and whether it's a great resource to know whether a breach has occurred or whether you just think it's, um, uh, you know, a shame. So there's a big difference there. So going out into the field, you can do that before logging, and that's what a lot of the citizen science work uh, would be really useful for is, and because remember that if you can actually trigger protections in, in these state forests, it means better conservation outcomes. So if you can find threatened fauna and flora and record their, uh, their existence, their locations, then that will compel Forestry Corporation to take account of those features. and. You may get um, exclusion zones of anywhere up to 100 metres in diameter, depending on what it is. So something interesting to look at when you're going into a forest before it's logged is that if you find any large trees, they call them giants, they're over 1.4 metres in diameter. And the way we measure them, which is difficult when it hasn't been cut down, but you wrap a tape around it, and in this case, the middle photograph shows a particular tape we're using called the diameter tape and it converts the um, the lineal uh, the lineal um, reading into a diameter reading by dividing it automatically by pi so this particular tree that I've got on the left and the right it's got a diameter of 1.64 meters at um, 30 centimeters off the ground that's classified as a giant so I like to take photos of that just in case you come back later on and they've been filled and you've got evidence that it was there. Uh, sometimes I wrap a coloured ribbon around the tree to let the contractors know that we know that it's there. Um, yeah. So something else to look for is yellow belly glider feed trees and you can identify them by horizontal chop marks or incisions into the bark because the yellow belly gliders like to return to particular trees and they must be retained. And sometimes forestry finds them and sometimes they don't. Also, all glider den trees must be retained. So it's a bit tricky to know where those are. You kind of have to follow the gliders around all night until just before dawn when they enter their hollow. And then you'll know that that's where their, their, their particular den tree is. Um, so just to give you an example, we photographed a tree like this, not this particular one, before a logging operation near Mogo. And we came back afterwards, it was gone. And so we've got the documentation there uh, and the EPA is working towards, hopefully, where uh, hopefully they're going to apply the fine of about $15,000 for dropping that tree. Um, yeah, before the logging operation, you can go in and spotlight. It's a great way to see what's there, particularly with the arboreal mammals and the nocturnal life. And then during and after logging operations. So we're, we're trying to um, document um, breaches now. So we're going in to gather evidence that might result in prosecutions or fines. So we're using our mobile phones and particular app that we find the best to use is this called Timestamp Camera. And this is the icon to look for when you go to the App Store. 
it's free to download and it's it basically puts the location of whatever feature you're trying to prove and report it locates it down to six decimal points of longitude and latitude so it's irrefutable so nobody can say that you took the photo in a different compartment or somewhere else altogether so that's a really great one to have on the phone um, and this is an example of it in action we've got a hollow bearing tree that was felled in um, one of the compartments in Mogo State Forest immediately after the bushfires 2019-20, when the um, prescription was that no hollow bearing trees were to be felled. Um, we found something like 70 in three compartments, so we reported them to the EPA and that was uh, subsequently resulted in a $45,000 fine. And the other way we're using our phone is to help navigate in the forest. And you really need to know where you are when you're exploring um, a logging operation. So this is an example of a harvest plan on the right here. The pale yellow is, is where there is called the net harvest area. And that's where contractors are allowed to go in and log. So any other color is an exclusion zone. So if you're walking around and you see um, trees that have been felled in say over here or over here, um, you can record those the locations of those stumps and you know for certain that they've actually been filled in an exclusion zone that's definitely worth reporting. Um, and those maps you can download from the, the Forestry Corporation portal, they're what's called geo-referenced. So it means that you can, when you upload them onto your uh, phone using an app such as Avenza, which is our chosen app and that's what the icon looks like. Once again, it's a free download. Um, then you can see exactly where you are. So the basic version, which is free, allows you to load up three maps at any one time. So you could be monitoring three dif different harvest plans uh, simultaneously. And this is an example of it in action. So the blue dot is me walking along this um, dotted black line, which is a vehicle track in the forest through the pale yellow, which is the loggable area. And I spotted in this pink zone that some stumps, there were some freshly cut stumps. So I went in and I dropped a pin or a place mark exactly where they were and I labeled that particular record and I was able to attach um, photos to that record. And then in that compartment, if I'd found 10, 20, 30, 40 breaches like that, I could compile them all into one document and export that to the EPA. And so they would have all the information in one fell swoop. Um, this is just an example of how you can, if you're on, on your own in the forest, you can document in this case, uh, what a giant tree is. So I'm just using the tape with one hand and I'm pulling right back with the phone and taking a photo with the other hand. And note once again, this timestamp here is down to six decimal points for latitude and six decimal points for longitude. But that's what the EPA is requiring for them to be able to go back and verify uh, the exact location of what you're alleging. And don't forget, you can also check the diameter of logs in the log dump. Um, we frequently go in on Sundays when there's no contractors, so there's, there's no interaction with the workers. And also keep an eye out for logs that have got any signs of yellow paint on the bark because they shouldn't have been felled at all. For instance, H for habitat trees. And don't forget the snake gate is very important. Uh, here's another breach that we've been reporting because if they, if the contractors leave debris piled more than one and a half meters high against the trees that are marked for attention, that's a big no-no. So that will result in a fine of some multiple thousands of dollars as well. Uh, and another one is gradient. So they're not allowed to log on slopes more than 30 degrees, but how do you check a slope? It's in, very difficult thing to find out. So we're using once again, an app called Clonometer. It's free. It looks like this in the app store. And you basically uh, lay that, lay your phone down on something flat on the ground plane. And we're just using a piece of timber that's about a meter long. So we're replicating the ground plane. And that's my uh, iPad. So I, I can see, if, you know, at a glance that it's only 21 meters a 21 degree slope, so it's legal for them to be logging there. 
Uh, sediment runoff is a big no-no, and the EPA is very interested if there's any runoff from logging operations. This is actually a photograph that an EPA field officer took uh, at Gladstone State Forest on the mid-north coast, and Forestry Corporation will find $30,000 for that breach. Um, if you've been reporting various breaches and you want to sort of keep a, a, a tabs on where the, the investigation process is at and whether it's resulted in fines or prosecutions, if you go to the EPA website and go to the news and media section, uh, type into the search bar forestry, it'll tell you uh, every time uh, a penalty notice is issued or a prosecution occurs, the EPA puts out a media release. So it's a really good repository of um, of the reputational damage that forestry is incurring these days. Um, and the, it's, we're referring journalists to this website all the time because it's quite astounding, the types of fines that are coming out. I've just got a few of them listed in that bar there on the right. Um, just in, in June alone, there was over $500,000 worth of fines. And we know for a certain that the EPA is pursuing a prosecution in Wild Cattle Creek that will result in $18 million worth of fines. It's not insignificant. So just to finish up, um, if you find things in the forest that you um, want to report, uh, document them in, in an email and send it to info at environment.newsouthwales.gov.au. It gets referred straight on to the EPA. Keep records of everything that you send to them. Um, uh, submit photographs with what you're alleging. Uh, consider going public with the allegations immediately and um, follow up with the EPA if they haven't responded within six months. That's all I've got time for tonight. Sorry if I spoke too quickly. Uh, and this is this um, presentation will be fleshed out uh, at a longer presentation at some stage later in the year. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Nick. That's fantastic. And, uh, and I want to particularly thank Nick for um, his assistance uh, with starting training some folk up the North Coast to, to uh, take the fantastic techniques that they've um, developed down um, as part of Coast Watchers and sort of apply them to other forestry hotspots across the state. Um, look, what a fantastic group of presentations. Um, I don't think we could have asked for any four people who could more adroitly have showed us the diversity of opportunities to participate in citizen science. Um, and I guess the thing I find really um, encouraging is the abundance of supporting tools and um, to help us both gather high quality information, but also to actually uh, lodge it in a way that it can be used um, effectively. And more than anything else, I can't imagine four presentations that sort of more effectively demonstrated this is not just about data for data's sake. This is us as citizen scientists actually generating information which is of extraordinary consequence for conservation management and conservation outcomes in this state. And frankly, doing work that government agencies aren't able or willing to do um, that's making a big difference. So I, I just have to just sort of um, commend and thank all of the presenters. Um, I wish we had a long time for questions, but it is, a, it is quite a short period uh, that we've got left, but I'm still going to sort of take the chair's or the MC's prerogative and ask the first couple of questions myself. Um, and the first one, I guess, is to Erin. Um, Erin, one of the long-standing concerns about our um, biological databases has been that in the past, they've been really dominated by work that's come out of environmental impact assessment, um, which is where you've got you know, paid professionals going out and getting the data, but what they tend to tell us is where things were before the coal mine went in. Um, and I was astonished by that graph that you put up about the proportion of data in Bionet that's actually coming from citizen scientists. And just wondering, um, is there any data that's suggesting that we're actually starting to see a much more realistic impression of where our biological resources are distributed across New South Wales? Yeah, that's a great question. We're actually just starting to look into the data a little bit more for, for that paper that's associated with the figure. Um, and some really interesting findings so far. Um, so for one, 
for one, we're finding that, so the ALA traditionally also had a lot of data from museums and collections. And we're finding that, and this speaks to a, a question in the chat as well, that citizen scientists are able to provide additional information outside of the sort of the, the cities or the population centers, if you will. Um, and also there are um, biases in the data in terms of, you know, there's a lot of observations of magpies, I must, I must say in the ALA, but there's been some fascinating papers about um, citizen scientists that are particularly interested in, in an insect, if you will, um, and they're able to provide a much richer picture of um, certain taxa than we've ever had before. So there's there's so much to do. I mean, you know, we've got 100 million data points now. There's, there's so much work to do in terms of querying the data and understanding um, how citizen scientists are contributing to a much richer picture of biodiversity in Australia, but there's certainly some, some fantastic evidence that we are. This isn't to say that there, there aren't still biases around roads and population centers. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to focus small when we're out bushwalking. So it's perhaps less birds um, and, and more insects and, and fungi going forward. Thanks, Erin. And my, my last selfish question, um, Steve mentioned that he's not a trained biologist, but I've got to say, as someone who's um, known and worked with many trained biologists, Steve's also the most talented field naturalist I've ever met. Um, and Steve, as someone who has spent decades wandering around Heathcote National Park, I'm just wondering if you could sort of reflect for us on um, what's going on with human search engines? What is it that we don't see things unless we're actually expressly searching for that particular thing. H how do we get to this point where the bloody tree wombats sort of managed to hide themselves so effectively for so long? You've answered your own question, Gary. I mean, I'm as embarrassed as anybody else because I've spent half my life walking around Heathcote National Park and the only koala I've ever seen was pointed out by the kid that was standing next to me. So until we actually specifically went looking, we didn't see them. And you would wonder, given their size and location, like sitting in clear sight up in a tree, how many other things we're not seeing because we're not looking for them. And, and I mean, this is right in Sydney. And here again, and thank you for your kind comments, but here again, this is with people that know the area. We still didn't see them. Yeah, it, it, look, it's a remarkable thing. And um, I, I guess it actually goes to that question of being an active sort of viewer of what's going on around you and, you know, actually having some um, targets in mind for the things that you're actually looking for. But uh, no, I just, I just find it a, a fascinating situation, sort of knowing how much of your time you spend looking up in the, in the trees after various avian sort of critters. Mm. Um, Okay. Sorry, can I just jump in on that for a second, yeah. just to add to that kind of um, that kids being amazing observers of the world um, on the water dragon um, project that we did, um, Dragons of Sydney, we just, you know, did backyard surveys and stuff. And we put out all these um, like letters and people, you know, said if they'd seen sightings of water dragons in their backyards. And then we chucked one in a question in of um, if they had kids because um, like the people who were filling out the survey had kids because we thought that that could be a deterrent, you know, loud, etc. But we actually saw that there was a correlation between people having kids and water dragon sightings. And it's really just probably because they're out in their backyard more, the kids are observing more. Um, and that's more of like an observation bias kind of thing rather than, you know, kids in the backyard um, making water dragons come. But yeah, interesting um, kind of addition to there. Keep your eyes open, have the curiosity of a child. Yeah. Thanks, Steph. Um, question from Jane, who's a, um, well, a long term Coonabarabran resident, asking how. Uh, mechanisms for data collection um, can actually work in large areas that are well away from the population bases. Um, and, and maybe Erin, you could have a sort of a, a, a go at that one, given you were just talking about sort of, I guess, biases in sort of the data collection or potential biases, yeah. Yeah, 
So it's it's very powerful. Um, and, and as I said, that paper by the Center for Ecosystem Sciences found that citizens were actually reporting observations of fire impacted areas at a scale that we saw equivalent to the size of the burn, which is an, an amazing finding. I think there's some important um, advances here. So many of the apps such as iNaturalist uh, use artificial intelligence to help curate observations. And the more records we have of a species, the better we, we train the algorithm and the better the AI, and that helps with the data quality. So obviously the more observations of a variety of taxa that we can submit to these uh, biodiversity reporting platforms, the better the data, the better the quality of the data. And so the higher percentage of records that we can ID down to species level as well, which is really important for our, our taxonomic diversity. So obviously species discovery is really important in, um, in larger areas away from major population centers and new locality of records as well. So we do have biases in the data. Um, and so new information, um, whether that's a sprouting, a, a, a picture of a, a something sprouting that we've never had a photograph of before um, or new localities, it, it's all really valuable and important. Great. A um, couple of questions for Nick. Uh, one from Tim about where you get one of those um, diameter or, or circumference to diameter conversion tape measures. And the other one from Margot asking why you're taking um, your measurements at 30 centimetres rather than the sort of traditional DBH that um, is usually used by foresters. Uh, sorry, diameter at breast height. Yep. Uh, Nick, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, so the where you actually measure the diameter varies according to um, lots of different things, but the CIFOA has determined in its prescription that the diameter is to be measured at 30 centimetres above the ground. So we're just going off that um, parameter. Um, and the diameter tape, we just went online and we you know typed in that diameter tape and Lufkin was the brand, L-U-F-K-I-N. And we had to get it, um, you know, we had to order online because it wasn't available in the local Bunnings or the local hardware store. And a couple of questions from Ewan. One to Erin asking whether ALA can provide um, assistance to community groups to set up citizen science projects effectively. Um, and then to Steph asking about uh, the citizen science manual and whether it's a good tool for getting sort of well, to, to helping uh, with community um, applications. So. Yeah, absolutely. So if it's um, a new project, uh, then we, we can, um, you know, set it up to something like the BioCollect platform if you're interested in systematic surveys. If it's about certain species, you know, we always recommend using an existing app. Um, no sense duplicating what's already out there, but really happy to chat further um, with anyone about how that might work. And Steph, do you yeah. want to finish on a, a last comment on the um, NPA Citizen Science Manual? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, you and I saw that you were saying asking specifically about um, community involvement and if the manual goes into that. Uh, it doesn't. It is specifically on survey techniques and setting up um, like a setting up the survey. Um, but I do have recommendations for if you did want to, you know, um, uh, start a project and wanted to make sure that there was, um, you know, more and people involved. Um, uh, contact your council, um, contact local active community groups, environmental community groups, um, and also um, potentially universities. If you're an NPA member um, and the area that you want to study is in an NPA branch, um, contact your local branch as well. Often they have, um, you know, they'll be able to lead you towards people who could be interested to help out in surveys or, you know, we've got um, uh, loads of people who are really not, not, uh, knowledgeable um, about um, IDing different species and stuff. Uh, they'll also know if there are uh, active, you know, science researchers from different unis who, who are involved in projects around the area. So, yeah, those are my tips to you. Thanks, Steph. And look, we're, we're on the dot on 7 p.m. and I'm, I'm aware that this number is going to get used for another conference in just a minute's time. Uh, look, I just want to finish again by sort of thanking 
uh, our four presenters tonight so much. Really appreciate it. And um, look, I'm, I'm always happy when I learn so much out of a webinar. I've enjoyed and learned a lot out of this one, and I'm sure all of our participants have. Thank you so much. And we'll see everybody at our next NPA webinar. Bye all.